handling fraud cases like this. Thanks for joining us again, Adam. Thanks you know, for having me, the, Beth. Yeah, it's, uh, you're in Florida, right? You're in Miami? Yes, I am. Okay, so what do you mean you have experience handling cases like this? Have you ever represented someone who's faked an illness? Well, I'll admit that I haven't, I haven't represented anybody who's faked an illness such as this, but I do handle and currently do have a few cases dealing with people who are committing fraud, whether that's tax fraud, fraud on other individuals. But I, I will acknowledge this is a very interesting and unique situation. Right. Okay. So there are all sorts of ways to steal. You don't just have to uh, dip into somebody's pocket um, and you can steal by deception, which is the, the theory here. So let me ask you about two things the defense has done. First of all, they waived a preliminary hearing, right? Now, I always thought the defense would likes a preliminary hearing. It's an opportunity to get a look at the state's evidence. Why would you waive it? I'm not quite sure why they waived it. Uh, preliminary hearing is a, is a very good tool for a defense attorney to get what we call a free crack at discovery. You're typically only able to interview witnesses, depose them, and gather certain information for one time and one time only, absent a court order. And in this particular case, I think it would have been very helpful for the defense to be able to hear what these witnesses were going to say first and to be able to even cross-examine them to see if some of their impeachment issues and some of the information they had would be effective at the time of trial. Right. Now, we don't know at this point, but perhaps there were some negotiations. I mean, I've had people waive uh, and go straight to the next accusatory instrument, waive grand jury. I was in New York where we did grand juries um, because there are plea negotiations going on and they just want to get the case over with. But in any event, uh, perhaps we'll learn down the road. Right. So an insanity defense is asserted, right? That's correct. Okay. Now, that means she admits to committing the acts, but she says, don't hold me responsible. I'm not criminally responsible, right? That okay. is correct. Okay. So, do you think that this is all the defense had to assert here? Because it seems like a hard defense to, to be able to prove. Yeah, I don't even think that it was necessarily a hard defense in this case. I think it was virtually impossible. Uh, you know, there was some uh, evidence or there is some evidence to suggest that she had a personality disorder. But to sit there and to say that she acquiesced as a result of that personality disorder and just ran or rolled with the punches is completely contradictory as to all the evidence. As you just heard the witness testify, she took specific acts in order to get people to do specific things and give this money in order to apparently go to concerts and spend uh, on herself. Certainly, this does not equate to somebody who essentially got themselves in a difficult situation due to her epilepsy and just didn't know how to get her way out of it. I mean, here's an individual who shaves her eyebrows. She shows up to functions. She reads and is, it participates in the drafting of these types of fundraising literature. And it, it just, I don't, I don't understand or I can't see where the defense of insanity would play its role in this particular matter. Well, you know, it's defined in Illinois where, let me see, the defense has to prove it by clear and convincing evidence, by the way, and they don't define clear and convincing. Um, because or by, or by virtue of mental disease or defect, a defendant lacks substantial capacity to appreciate the criminality of her conduct, right? So they don't use the buzzwords we see in a lot of states, no right from wrong. Appreciate the criminality of her conduct. But it does seem that she's taken steps, as you've just uh, you mentioned some of them, to where show, it shows she does appreciate the criminality because she continues to mask this, this disease she knows she doesn't have and act like she has it, shaving her, shaving her head, shaving off her, her eyebrows and continuing this charade. It, really, not only does she, yeah. I'm sorry, Beth, go ahead. No, go ahead. Not only does she take those particular steps that we talked about, but the second count in this particular case alleges that after all of this started to come to fruition, she got nervous, she actually calls, I believe his name is Art Hooker, and tries to say to this gentleman, go ahead and write a letter saying that you donated money to me for other reasons other than the fact that I had this inoperable cancer. And to be able to do that clearly shows that you can appreciate the nature and quality of your acts and you knew what you did was wrong. So I don't see that in this particular case. I think that's very damaging evidence to her. 
You know, what's interesting about the scenario you just described, it, it led to another charge against her, but uh, she had received $3,000 from, from that organization. And uh, if that letter were believed, if he had written it, he never did write it, if he had written it and it were believed, then it would apparently bring down the donations below the threshold for the, the at least $10,000 that makes it a felony. So it would have been a lesser charge if she could have knocked out that $3,000. So that, that's a pile that on to she appreciated the criminality. That, that is a great point, Beth. And I, and I think that that is well uh, identified in the state's case is that if, as you're correct, if she was able to knock down some of these donations to show that they were donated for other reasons, she could have been looking at a lesser charge, which would have resulted possibly in a lesser sentence. But absolutely, it goes to her intent. It goes to her knowledge. It goes to all of this conduct, which was well thought out and well calculated. And listen, she carried it out until it was too late, as the witness just testified. Suspicion started to be, you know, it started to surround this circumstance once money started to dwindle and a lot of that money started to go to things that weren't necessarily what they were intended for. Right. Well, thank you so much, Adam. We'll get back to you in the next hour.